the arrival of Keynes and his general theory in 1936 heralds a big break in the history of economics. Prior to the arrival of Keynes, we could think of the subject as being largely influenced by the ideas of Adam Smith, who wrote his Wealth of Nations in 1776. The impact of Adam Smith was not so theoretical as in the fundamental suppositions of economic theory, which dominated the subject in the next hundred and 50 years. The coming of Keynes heralded a complete change in the beliefs underlying economic theory. In other words, from Smith to Keynes, we see a major change in the perspective of economics. So, let us look at the state of economic theory before the arrival of Keynes. Now, there were some central beliefs which characterized economists and not only economists, but also people who thought about economic processes in the tradition of Adam Smith. Briefly, to recap, we know that Adam Smith was a firm believer in the power of market in ensuring efficiency in the economy. Adam Smith was highly suspicious of not only monopoly and such other factors that tended to harm the competitive aspect of markets, but he was also highly suspicious of the government, because he looked upon the government as the most solidified of monopolies. So, it is implicit in the tradition of Adam Smith to believe that economic processes are efficient if free market is responsible for the conduct of economic processes. This is the logic of the famous argument of the invisible hand in Adam Smith, as we already know. So, free markets ensure efficiency, which also means that the way to welfare in an economy is ensured by a minimal presence of the government laissez-faire, the policy of non-interference is very crucial in the arguments of Smith and his followers. It was very clear that the government was necessary to defend the nation. It was very clear that the government was necessary to ensure law and order. It was very clear that the government was necessary to ensure protection of property, but beyond that the less the government did, the better it is for the economy. This was the philosophy of laissez-faire. If we look back a little bit, the philosophy of laissez-faire is something like an economic justification of the ideas of John Locke. John Locke, for instance, argued or created the first libertarian argument, as it were, which said that the individual's freedom in contracting a social organization as and how the individuals wanted was very central to the welfare of a people. Now, the economic phase of the Lockean political argument is Smith's economics. So, efficiency in the economic process is ensured would also mean that the political system based on such individual choices is also efficient in a moral sense. So, the central belief are that markets are efficient and 
implicit in this is the notion that markets ensure the freedoms of the individuals in ensuring in turn welfare. What does this mean about markets? Does it mean that markets are always efficient? Does it mean that markets always deliver the goods? Well, certainly by the time of the earliest of the market oriented laissez faire disciples of Smith, namely J. B. Say, the opinion had solidified, crystallized to the point of understanding that there could be short run problems with the market. That is, in the short run, you could have excess demand, you could have excess supply in specific markets which show disequilibria and which therefore show possibility of improvement of efficiency. However, in Say's arguments, there can be no general overproduction in the economy, which means that in the long run, such short run variations, such, such short run disequilibria tend to vanish. So, market fluctuations are only short run phenomena as one of the central beliefs of the disciples of Adam Smith must be remembered. Combined with this is a notion that in the long run, there is no scope for any fluctuation, because in the long run is also a period when all adjustments have taken place and there are no more adjustments to take place. So, this perspective, this set of central beliefs takes on two forms of analytical dogma in economics. One set of analytical dogma believe in the generality of equilibrium in the economic process in the market. The other sets of dogma believe in the partiality of equilibria. In other words, efficiency is ensured in each and individual market and that study of each market is a partial equilibrium analysis and in aggregate the whole economy she is shown to be in efficiency. Whereas, in a general equilibrium analysis simultaneously all the markets are considered to be in equilibrium. The equilibrium in one market orchestrates equilibrium in other markets and therefore, all markets are simultaneously in equilibrium. So, we have two distinctive approaches as we have already seen the general equilibrium and the partial equilibrium approach. We have already seen that the general equilibrium approach is attributable to, attributable to Leon Walras and the partial equilibrium analysis is attributable not just to Jevons, Menger and others of his time, but also subsequently to Marshall and all other economists including Hicks, Samuelson and others much later who contributed to this genre of economics known as neoclassical economics. So, broadly we have the two approaches, the Walrasian approach and the neoclassical approach defining two dogmas of freedom of the market. Let us now look at both of them simultaneously or both of them one after another. As I said, the premises of partial equilibrium analysis relate to individual markets and therefore, individual actors in these individual markets. So, some basic premises are involved relating to the behavioral norms followed by these individual actors. One is hedonism. Hedonism of course, as we all know means pleasure seeking. Human beings are congenitally hedonistic according to this premise. Human beings are congenitally pleasure seekers and consequently avoiders of pain. Everything else in life is included in a matrix of pain and pleasure, things which are avoided by people which are painful, things which are sought by people which are pleasurable and therefore, all human beings are hedonistic 
according to this premise. The second premise is that not only are individual actors in individual markets hedonistic, namely pleasure seekers, but these individual actors in individual markets are also rational. Now, the word rationality has many interpretations. It could be a very narrow interpretation to mean a very given set of objectives which are to be reached with a specific set of tools. So, you use these tools to obtain, obtain these objectives, you could be calling yourself rational. In a more general, in a much more broad spectrum application of the word rationality, we could think in terms of people who use the power of reason, who use the power of reason in order to articulate their way through the problems of existence, the problems of choice. In this way, rationality would mean that people are constantly perceiving life, perceiving existence as a series of choice one choice situation after another, one choice situation after another ad nauseum. And in each choice situation, the actor is asking the question, what is it to be gained out of this choice? And what is to be lost? In other words, what is the price to be paid? So, should I or should I not have this particular commodity for my consumption? If so, that is the gain then the loss would be what I have to pay for it. So, the rational activity in this case would be a comparison of the price to be paid for a commodity and the value that particular commodity affords to the consumer. So, all situations are viewed as choice situations and all such choice situations are viewed as being resolved on the basis of rationality in the sense in which we have just seen it. Now, this is a very strong assumption, it is a very strong assumption because it assumes that fundamentally or non rational situations in life cannot be considered within economic theory. For example, if somebody falls in love, he comes and tells you I am in love, you cannot tell him to be in love rationally, you can only tell him you are in love. So, what do you feel? The man says, I am feeling very happy or the woman says, I am very happy. So, what do you want to do about it? Well, I want to spend a lot of time with this other person. Great. So, how long are you going to go on doing it? I do not know. I just want to spend a lot of time. You see, here is a situation where rationality is not resolving anything for you. There is a demand to spend time with the other person. You go on spending time with the other person. You do not know what price is to be paid. Does not matter. Why? Because you are in love. It is a non-rational situation. So, there are a whole lot of non-rational situations in life, where people act on the basis of decisions which are not really rational. Another example which one could talk about is a situation where causes are involved causes in the sense that these are ideals for which people would like to sacrifice. For example, nationalism is a cause. An appeal can be made, save money and contribute to the national development fund. Now, this is not a rational choice, an appeal for a rational choice. You might like to spend the money very usefully in your idea by buying yourself something to eat or by some buying something to wear, but this appeal which tells you to spend your money for national development is going beyond the choice of rational choice of options that you are facing. It is merely telling you okay, get beyond all these things, the nation needs your money, put it in the national kitty and we will use it for the betterment of the nation. Now, here is a situation which is non rational in the sense that the choice in which we have talked about it earlier does not come into play at all. So, what we are trying to show at this point is that there are a whole lot of human situations where rationality is not involved in any choice situation. Sometimes 
choice situations themselves are not very clear and very evident. Now, one of the central facets of the partial equilibrium analysis is that it is not possible to consider any of these situations unless it is viewed as a rational choice. This is a very restrictive premise in the sense that it seems to restrict human behavior into a very narrow corridor into which you want to see everything moving. Well, that is the way partial economic analysis is and we have to accept that. Another very crucial aspect of partial equilibrium analysis at least at the time of Marshall, we shall now see also how it what happened after Marshall, but at the time of Marshall certainly cardinal utilitarianism was accepted as the norm. What is utilitarianism? We know that utilitarianism is a philosophy which stated that the worth or value of anything is to be seen in terms of the utility that it offers, the usefulness which it offers. And the utility according to utilitarians is something measurable. Some of the early utilitarians were thinking in terms of measures like util, eating this is so many utils, drinking that is so many utils, taking a walk is so many utils. They tried to bring in some such measurement into it. That was the power of their belief. But whether they could measure in terms of utils or not, the fact was that there was a very clear assumption that nothing was worth anything either in a philosophical sense or in an ethical sense or in the sense of being worthwhile unless it had utility to offer. So, utilitarianism then was centrally based on the idea that everything has utility and the choice among situations in life was basically dependent upon the utilities offered by different situations in life. If they are ranked and if they are compared, then you could order life into more satisfactory, less satisfactory, higher level of welfare, less level of welfare according to the ranking of the utilities in different life situations. This is utilitarianism in brief. Now, utilitarianism of this type is very central to partial equilibrium analysis. For one thing, everything in equilibrium analysis is attributed to the utilities that that thing has, whether it is an event or it is an object or whether it is a service, it is considered as being useful only if that thing has a power to satisfy your want. If you want a glass of water, you assume that you are thirsty and that glass of water will have a power to satisfy your thirst that power of that glass of water to satisfy your want is the utility of that water. Likewise, everything that you consume, the water that you drink, the food that you eat, everything else virtually has utility. Now, the crucial thing about partial equilibrium analysis as in the case of early utilitarians is that they assumed that this utility was measurable. You could strictly quantify it, so that ranking of utilities was possible very rigorously and very tightly. This cardinality of assumption namely that you could fix numbers on the utilities of objects and thereby you could be comparing them and ranking them. This fix the, the ability of us to fix numbers on the utility of objects is what is called cardinality. So, cardinal utilitarianism is a very central, very central premise of partial equilibrium analysis. At the time of Marshall, it was assumed actually that money measured the utility of objects to us. In other words, you could measure this cup of ice cream, the utility that it offers me, it is worth 5 rupees. So, I just had 5 rupees worth ice cream if I had a cup of ice cream. Now, added to that are other rules which come into play that if I keep having one cup after another of ice creams, 
then ice cream will have a declining utility because you know it is less and less satisfactory. You get tired of the sweetness of ice cream, you get tired of the coolness of ice cream. So, each additional cup of ice cream means less and less to you. In other words, you are thinking in terms of, terms of a situation where utility can also decline through repeated use of something. In that situation, you say the first cup perhaps had 5 rupees worth of utility, the second cup perhaps had 4 rupees worth of utility and so on and so forth. In other words, not only can you rank utility, you can rank utility in terms of the value measured by money. Now, this is central, absolutely central to the economics of Marshall and to the cardinal utility analysis of Marshall. Now, there are lots of problems here. If money measures the utility of objects, then what measures the utility of money? See what I mean? You see, I have 10 rupees in my pocket. I can say the 10 rupees measures the value of maybe 5 chocolates. So, we say each chocolate is 2 rupees. Then I say, okay, what is the utility of 10 rupees? It is not 10 chocolates because it could be 10 chocolates, it could be 15 peppermints, it could be one something large. In other words, Money can buy a lot of things and so its worth can be measured in a number of ways. So, what is the utility of money? It becomes highly variable. Now, imagine a situation where you are measuring cloth with a meter stick and as you go on measuring the meter stick keeps expanding and contracting in size. Then how can you measure cloth? Imagine that you are measuring milk and you say okay, here is 1 liter of milk measured by a liter jar and then another liter of milk a liter jar. Suppose the liter jar keeps changing its size, it shrinks and expands, shrinks and expands and each time you pour it might be a liter or more, you do not know, you do not know at all because the measuring jar itself is changing. So, when you want to measure something with something that which measures has to be constant. Here Marshall was using money as a measure of utility of objects. So, the utility of everything on earth could be measured with money. It is 3 rupees worth, 2 rupees worth, 10,000 rupees worth, 50,000 rupees worth and so forth. But what measured the utility of money? What about the utility of money? Now, this was a major question which had to be faced and taken care of by means of a very special assumption. Marshall assumed that the utility of money is constant at some given value. For instance, constant at some value 1. So, that whatever money measured, its, its utility did not change and therefore, the utility of objects measured by money also remained constant and absolute. Now, therefore, we have got two sets of issues here. One, utilities of objects are measurable, utilities of services are measurable. Two, they are measurable in terms of money and in order to make this possible, you have to assume that the utility of money itself is constant at some one, some unity, some neutral number like that. More than one, it keeps changing the value of utility is measured. So, you do not want to do it less than 1, it changes. So, 1 is a neutral number. So, that is great. So, this is the assumption of cardinal utility as measured by money. This is the premise. Granted this premise, granted this premise, the analysis worked. The analysis worked quite efficiently. There are innumerable markets for innumerable goods. There are a large number of buyers for these goods and there are a large number of sellers of these goods. So, people go to the market, they look around and they say, okay, here are peanuts, here is butter, here is a chair, there is a piece of fabric 
some cloth, great. Let me buy the fabric. It looks attractive, maybe it will make a good curtain or a bed cloth, whatever. What does it cost? The person says, sir, this is 15 rupees. Then I say, 15 rupees? Is it worth 15 rupees to me? Is it worth more than 15 rupees to me? So, if the utility of something measured in money is worth more than its price, I say, great, I am gaining. I pay only 15 rupees, but I, but I get something which is to me worth a lot more than 15 rupees. So, I will buy it. But if it is just 15 rupees worth, I will say, okay, I mean, I can just about manage it because it is, I have to pay 15 rupees and I am getting 15 rupees worth of utility, that is okay. It is a good trade off, I do not lose. But if it is 15 rupees in price and if I have to consider it when I think it is less than 15 rupees worth. Suppose I say, oh, I have got three bed sheets already. This will be the fourth bed sheet. It is pretty, but I have got three bed sheets already. So, the fourth bed sheet is going to be in a waiting list for being used. So, maybe I can think of it is pretty, so I will maybe give it 5 rupees. So, the utility of that fourth bed sheet is only 5 rupees, but the price is 15 rupees. So, in this situation, the utility that I get out of the bed sheet is less than the price I pay for it, I am not going to buy it. So, choice in terms of what you have to pay as price and what is offered by the good or commodity to you in terms of the utility measured in money terms. This is the way partial equilibrium analysis worked with Marshall. All the consumers constantly compare the utilities they, that they get of the commodity, out of the commodity with what they have to pay, which is the loss of money as price paid to it and see whether there is a net gain, whether there is a net loss and that decides their choice. But then as I said, there is a little catch to it. Remember the ice cream story? I said it is possible that the first ice, ice cream might be worth 5 rupees to you. Then you have the next one, it is not so sweet. It is not so refreshing. It is not so cool. You say, oh, it is not as good as the first ice cream. It is not really true. When the fellow made it, he put the same ingredients in both the ice creams. It is just that your taste buds are satisfied a little bit. So, your second ice cream is not giving you that much of a thrill as the first one did. So, what is actually happening is that the utility of the second ice cream is now lower to you than the utility of the first ice cream. Am I right? In which case, we have to say the first ice cream maybe is worth 5 rupees, the second ice cream maybe 4 rupees 50 paise, but not 5 rupees. Then okay, I go on and have a third ice cream. I still think it is attractive. It has got a nice pink color, mm, very attractive. I eat it, but I said, oh, I am fully sated. I do not like anything sweet anymore. I do not like anything cool anymore. I had this third ice cream. It is not really as good to me as the first and second ice cream. So, what is happening? The third ice cream is probably worth 2 rupees not 450, not 5. So, what is happening here according to Marshall is that there is a particular behavior which utility is following when you consume things. When you keep continuously consuming something according to Marshall, the utility of that thing declines. Now, that rule is expanded. When you consume something continuously, its utility declines fine. When you use a laborer in the same situation, his productivity might change. For instance, you have one laborer to clean up this studio. The person is doing some work. You bring in the second laborer. You also clean the studio. Now, there are two people getting in each other's way. So, how much they can clean the studio is now much less than before. So, in other words, the productivity of the first laborer when he or she is all alone cleaning this room might be one thing, but when the second one comes in, they get in each other's way. 
productivity of the laborers fall. When you introduce the third one, the first two laborers are certainly irritated. They say, now you do not need the third person, he or she is going to certainly get in the way and that happens. So, by the time the third laborer comes in, the productivity falls even more. No? So, just as in the case of ice creams, so too in the case of labor, so too in the case of machines, so too in the case of ever so many things which are used in the production process. So, Marshall is thinking in terms of a very general law, a very general law which acquired almost the same significance in economic theory as Newton's laws acquired in physics. And this law is the law which says that repeated use of something makes its utility fall, the law of diminishing utility. Of course, it does not happen all the time. For instance, suppose you take a spoon of ice cream, immediately follow it with the second spoon, follow it with the third spoon, you will you will be able to see the taste declining. But suppose you have a spoon of ice cream now, an hour later you have the second spoon of ice cream, you might be even more thirsty, you might like the second spoon better. And third ice cream you might have two days later, third spoon you might have two days later and you might feel the third spoon is even more, even tastier. In other words, the repetition of consumption has to be in suitable time units, suitable time gaps. In other words, there has to be a reasonable margin of time between consumption. And similarly, you cannot say one bucket of ice cream is the first consumption, second bucket of by the time you are through with the first bucket, you cannot consume any more ice cream. So, again the units of consumption must be reasonable. So, there are lots of, lots of uh, uh, contexts in which you have got to modify this law. But the fact remains that the law is accepted from the time of Marshall, the law is accepted as universal. All economists come to accept that the law of diminishing utility, its application in consumption or production is universal. Now, that is very central, that is very central because that determines a whole lot of theory. What happens is, when you are comparing the price of an ice cream with its utility, the question arises, is it the first ice cream or the second ice cream or the third ice cream? because the price is the same. The price in the shop of one cup of ice cream is 5 rupees. Your first ice cream, ice cream might give you utility of 6 rupees. You may say, oh, it is great. I am having great fun with this ice cream. I am getting much more out of it than what I have to pay for it. Lovely. Then you come to the second ice cream, gives you less utility and you say, okay, it is worth 5 rupees. What is the price? 5 rupees. Okay, the second ice cream is just about worthwhile. The third ice cream, 4 rupees 50 paise. Oh no, I cannot pay 5 rupees for an ice cream which is now only 4 rupees 50 paise worth to me, so I do not want it. In other words, how you make your choice, how you spend your money is very crucially determined by this law of diminishing utility. The utility of objects is not constant, it keeps changing according to the law which simply says as you go on using them, its utility falls. And therefore, what price are you comparing with, what item becomes very crucial. If you are comparing an ice cream price, standard one ice cream is 5 rupee, 5 rupee, 5 rupee. It does not mean that you will compare every ice cream in the same way, no, because the first ice cream has higher utility, second ice cream has less utility and so forth. So, the fact that utility is declining is a very crucial factor in determining how many ice creams you will eat. Am I right? In other words, choice in economics is not only a function of the measurability of utility in money terms, but also is conditioned by the fact that utility declines. Right? These utility laws might be compared to entropic loss in physics. In other words, the law of entropy in physics simply says that as you have more and more and more of objects which manifest energy, the amount of free energy in the system goes less and less and less. 
the utility law is pretty much the same as you go on have more and more and more goods to consume the utility available to you becomes less and less and less. So, very often people who are thinking of comparing disciplines they compare the utility laws with the entropy laws of physics, but whether you compare it with entropy laws of physics or not the fact remains that cardinal utility analysis means that you measure utility in money terms and not only that you measure utility which is declining. So, the whole problem of economic choice is determined not only by the fact that utility is measurable in money and then you pay, pay for them in money terms, but it is also determined by the fact that the utility declines. So, three basic premises for partial equilibrium analysis that people are hedonistic, people are rational and utility is cardinal and measurable in money terms. Now, the problem of choice through which economics is studied in all economic problems whether partial equilibrium or general equilibrium. The problem of choice relates to the question of am I solving my problem of choice efficiently or not. In other words, am I using the resources at my disposal efficiently or not. Remember, you have so many rupees in your pocket you have 20 rupees in your pocket and each ice cream costs 5 rupees. So, the maximum number of ice creams that your budget can provide for is 4 ice creams. And you say well if I am getting more than 5 rupees worth of utility from every ice cream and each ice cream costs only 5 rupees then 4 ice creams is great. I can have all 4 and still make something extra. In other words, I get something gain something more than what I pay for. So, the problem of efficiency in economics is always tied up with the question of gains and losses. Whenever you make a choice to buy something, you get the utility of that thing as we have just now seen that is measured in money terms. And in order to get that thing, you got to lose something that is some little bit of money from your purse, the price that you pay. So, there is a loss of purchasing power from you which you incur in order to gain some utility. So, efficiency in economics is measured in terms of whether what you are paying, what you are losing is more than compensated by what you get. Which, as I said, if I am getting an ice cream which, is, which has a utility of 6 rupees, if I am paying only 5 rupees for it, then it is a very efficient choice because I am getting 1 rupee worth of extra utility. There is a net gain. Now, as I go on consuming ice cream, this net utility might drop, drop, drop till I have to pay 4 rupees 50 paise, I have to pay 5 rupees for an ice cream which is only 4 rupees 50 paise worth. In this case, I will think, okay, what is the net gain minus 50 paise? I am losing in this choice, I do not want this choice, so I do not choose that ice cream. I stop when the price of ice cream is 5 rupees and the utility got from it is at least 5 rupees or more. In short, the idea of efficiency in economics is always in relation to the resources which have to be used for satisfaction of demands for consumption. In other words, you have to spend resources in order to get utility. And for a given unit of resources that you spend, how much utility can you make for it determines your efficiency. In the case of ice cream, 5 rupees is the resource you have to spend and what you get is the utility of ice cream that might be 6 rupees or 5 rupees or 450 and that will tell you how you choose ice creams. Efficient choice is one where utility of ice cream is more than the price paid for it. An inefficient choice is one where you are forced to buy an ice cream but you pay much more than what the utility of the ice cream is to you. So, the idea of efficiency in economics is always tied up with how resources are used. Are the resources which are used bringing me sufficient returns or are they not bringing sufficient returns? Now, in the case 
of ice cream, we know that the returns is the utility of ice cream, but then in all other commodities, in all other consumption activities, there is always a utility which is measured in money terms. So, efficiency moves like this. Now, the way in which partial equilibrium analysis discusses this issue is when this choice is shown in as an equilibrium or a disequilibrium situation. Initially, let us say because the consumption is valuable to me, the utility I get out of it is high and I go on consuming more and more and more, the utility goes on falling till such time as the utility becomes the same as the price which I have to pay for it and at that point I stop. I stop because I say I am getting just about money's worth. Now, that equilibrium is called the consumer's equilibrium in economics. You can see in the PowerPoint presentation that the consumer's equilibrium is marginal utility m u equals p the price. In other words, marginal utility is the utility of the last unit I am consuming. Before that, there are more units which I had already consumed which had higher utility. The utility is declining, declining, declining but the last unit I am going to consume now, does it have enough utility which will at least tell me that I can pay the price for it. In other words, the marginal utility has to be equal to price. Beyond that, when marginal utility declines below price, then it is not worth it. So, the equilibrium condition in for the consumer in economics then is m u equals p as you see in the PowerPoint presentation. Like the consumer, the producer uses a lot of resources. The consumer is using only the money in his pockets. The producer is using raw materials, the producer is using, using labor power, the producer is using power, the producer is using space, go down, machines, all sorts of resources are being used by the producer and he has to consider whether these resources are being used efficiently. How does that happen? He cannot look at all these resources and look at production in one totality because then it is a very complex problem. He has to look at each resource as a separate market. So, then he looks at the market for labor, how many laborers should I employ, that choice. Then market for finance, how much money can I borrow from the market depends upon how what that money is doing to my business. So, that is another choice. Third, how much power should I use for producing goods in my factory? Given the power tariff, how much power should I use? In other words, once again a choice relating to another resource. So, the producer is faced with a number of choice situations with each resource that he is using, right. And in each case, that particular resource is bringing in some return and he has to pay a particular price for that resource. In other words, take the example of labor. If you include a labor in production process, he might be able to produce let us say 20 pieces of soap each day in a soap factory. Then you say okay, 20 pieces of soap is the productivity of this laborer. What can I sell each piece of soap for? 5 rupees. Okay. What does this laborer want? 70 rupees. Okay. He can produce 5 into 20, 100 rupees worth of output. I pay only 70 rupees. So, the productivity of the laborer is higher than the price I pay for labor. I shall employ him. In other words, the rule that you follow is that the productivity of that particular resource is higher at least equal to the price that is paid for that resource. So, in this way the producer looks at all the resources and engages in a calculation of this type with each resource. Then what happens as a product of this is the cost of paying all the resources bring in a certain cost of production to him. So, for each additional soap that he produces, he may be paying so much labor, 
he may be paying so much interest to the bank for the funds that it advanced, he might be paying so much for power, for electricity used in the production process and so forth. So, each soap might have a cost of production consisting of so much for labor, so much for electricity, so much for raw material, so much for this, that, etcetera. This is the cost of producing soap. Then what does it sell in the price? That is the revenue from soap. So, the producer will say, is it worthwhile my being in business? It is worthwhile if my being in business ensures profit. If it is not, if it is not bringing profit, it is not worthwhile. In other words, the revenue that I make from the business has to be higher than the cost I incur. Then I make a profit, it is worthwhile. But as the revenue goes on declining and as the cost is constant, comes a point when the revenue equals cost. The revenue brought in by the last piece of soap which I produced is just about equal to the cost of the last piece of soap. Beyond that, I do not want to produce soap. The rule is marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Very much like the consumer, the producer is faced with the problem of the price that you have to pay to produce one piece of soap and the money that you make out of it. So, the difference here is the difference is between the cost of production and the revenue from production as opposed to the price and utility in the case of a consumer, but the choice is pretty much the same. So, producer's equilibrium would be marginal cost equals marginal revenue. More importantly, not just marginal, not this last piece of soap which I am manufacturing, but what is the average price of all the soaps that I have made? The cost is varying and the revenue is varying. But on, on an average, is the revenue from soap at least equal to the cost of soap, then it is worthwhile. But on an average, if the revenue from soap is higher than the cost of soap, great, I am making good money. But if on an average, the revenue from soap is not as good to meet the costs, then I do not want to make soaps. In other words, efficiency for the producer means rules which say marginal cost equals marginal revenue or average cost equals average revenue. So, we have producers equilibrium, you have consumers equilibrium in partial equilibrium analysis. In both cases, there is a cardinal utility measurement involved either as productivity or utility and this value of the consumption in terms of productivity or utility as the case may be is compared with the resources which the use of that particular activity is costing whether it is consumption or whether it is production you spend money and you say this is the cost this is the price either way then you compare it the gains with the losses. So, efficiency condition in neoclassical economics, Marshallian economics, in partial equilibrium analysis involves the study of efficiency in terms of equilibrium conditions. The utility, marginal utility of something must be at least equal to the price, if not more. Marginal revenue from some production activity should be at least equal to the costs of undertaking that activity. In other words, marginal revenue should be at least equal to the marginal cost, but more generally in the long run, the average revenue must be at least equal to the average cost. Now, these are the rules which are there in partial equilibrium analysis, which ensure that on the one hand, consumer is in equilibrium and therefore efficient, producer is in equilibrium and therefore efficient. And these lead to efficiency of the system as a whole. So, if every consumer is behaving efficiently like this, if every producer is behaving efficiently like this, then the market economy, which is nothing but a collection of these consumers and producers, is an efficient economy. In other words, laissez faire, as we saw, and non interference by the government is worthwhile. The economy is solving its own problems, it does not need any government. In other words, partial equilibrium analysis tried to provide for an Adam Smith premise in the analysis of equilibrium conditions. At this point in time, we shall take a break and 
after the break going to look at general equilibrium analysis or what we have seen as Walrasian economics.